morning, everybody. Let's get started with Sunday School. Jesus loves me. Let's sing. Jesus loves me. This I know. sung in a while. How about 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad, 2 were good. Do I have some helpers who want to help? Then come up and help. If you want to help, come up and help. Just stand up here in the front. Short 
kids in the front, tall kids in the back. That's how we do it usually here. They're all about the same height. That's not how I'll stand in the back. Here we go. Twelve and went to spy and came and ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they saw and came and ten were bad and two were good? Some saw giants big and strong. Some saw rays and clusters long. Some saw that was a little. Ten were bad and two were good. Faster? Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. You can make some people happy some of the time. A lot of people know we won't. <laughs> Let's go a little bit faster. Twelve of the spy and came and ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they spy and came and ten were bad and two were good? Some saw giants big and strong. Some saw graves that were close and long. Some saw mountains in the all. Ten were bad and two were good. Faster. No. Faster. No. Alright, we'll go faster. This is the fastest though. No faster after this, right David? The fastest? No. Here we go. Good enough. <laughs> Twelve went, ten were bad, two were good. That's pretty easy math. Let's leave it right. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be ready to have the kids dismissed. Sunday school here. Heavenly Father, we thank you we could be at church this morning. We do ask that you bless. Help each mind to be open, ready to learn, help the teachers as they bring forth the lessons this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right, as the kids head out, does anybody need a handout this morning? Did we get one to everybody? Well, the Franks got them. If Anybody's missing any? All right, any handouts? Everybody got a handout? <laughs> Run away. All right, if you got your Bible this morning, head to the book of Mark. Mark chapter number 4, we'll begin there, look at a few different scriptures, Mark chapter 4, I left your hand out just a little bit different, I've got some things under some of those points, but rather than give you all of the outline, um, I just left you some blanks if you want to add in a few notes uh, there, so it's a little bit different this time, for one it helped it fit on the paper. Uh, but anyway, sometimes my subpoints get to be long and intense. But uh, so anyway, we've got your hand out there. We will uh, get into that in a moment. But let's begin in Mark chapter number four. Mark chapter number four. It's good to see everybody out. Good to see Grandma Miller back. She survived. No, I'm just kidding. But she's back. Good to see Brother Frank, Miss Julian. Mr. Wood, it's good to have him back. He and his wife have been sick. His wife still is not feeling good. So if you think of her, be in prayer for her. And then I saw Mr. Carter on Friday. He's still, he's in the rehab over in uh, Fort Myers. And he'll be there, I don't know how long. One day he told me 10 to 12 days. Another day he told me about a week. And uh, so I know he's hopeful. But uh, anyway, be in prayer for him. Uh, and he might even be watching. I don't know. I tried to get his phone set up so he could. So if you are, Mr. Carter, hi. Praying for you, and uh, and then if you think of uh, of Mrs. Horton today, uh, be in prayer for her. Uh, it's been about a year ago today that Brother Horton passed away. So anyway, if you think of her, just be in prayer for her uh, today as well. All right, I think that's about everything. Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four. Let's begin in verse number thirteen. We have here a, a common pretty commonly known parable, the parable of the sower. Mark 4, 13, he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. 
And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and notice this, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some an hundred. God here is talking about uh, the sowing of the word of God. And he speaks of basically four different types of ground that it happens. There's that that falls on the wayside. There's that that falls on stony ground. There's that that falls among the thorns. And then there is that that hits good ground. Uh, a couple of excellent points on that that have nothing to do with this message, but it's a simple fact of uh, when the sower sowed, he sowed indiscriminately. He just got the seed out there everywhere he could get it. <clears throat> it was not his choice as to what ground it was. And I would say this, as we go out, we hand out tracts and we try to tell people about Jesus. <clears throat> we can't look at a person and know what's going on in their heart. We can't know the ground of their heart. Our job is to simply sow the word of God and leave it to God. But as we do, we understand that different hearts are going to be different types of soil. And sometimes Satan's going to pull that away. Others, they're going to seem excited for a little while. But then when something difficult happens, they'll disappear. Some, it's going to fall on good ground and they're going to grow. They'll get saved. They'll get grow as a Christian. And they'll become a very fruitful Christian. But some, and in context with our lesson today... Some, where he talks about stony ground, here's what happens there in verse 19. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It's the idea here that as they come in and they crowd the seed, there's no room for it to grow. You think about the thorns, they come in, they take up all the soil. <clears throat> There's no room for the seed to get the soil that it wants. And so the picture here is it chokes the word of God out so that it doesn't grow into something fruitful. I want you to understand this morning that the devil wants to keep the word of God from growing in your heart and becoming fruitful. And so he'll try different things with you. But if you'll let the Word of God come in and grow, you'll become fruitful. But one of the tools that he'll use is the attack of this world. By using the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, <clears throat> the lust of this world, which 1 John 2 tells us is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He'll get these things and allow them to come in you and they'll choke out the Word of God <clears throat> within you. So it's important to understand from this passage, the world is not content. We looked at the heart of this world last week. We looked at the prince of the world previous weeks. We know the world's wicked. We know the world is evil. But understand, the world is not content to just sit back and say, <clears throat> well, we're wicked, we're evil, but we're a lot of fun. Come choose us. And, uh, but if you choose not to, we're going to leave you alone. That's not the way it works. The world will, and the cares of this world, will attack you and try to get you to either be destroyed as a Christian, disabled as a Christian, or it will sow enough false doctrine in there to divide you from God and the truth. And those are basically the way the world attacks us, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. Now, before I go any further, I try to say this every week. I'll say it again because I want us to understand this. When we are talking about the world, we are talking about the world system. 
We're talking about a society that is full of lost people, and therefore uh, the devil is, the Bible calls him the ruler of this world, he calls him the prince of this world, and he is trying to maneuver this world against God and against the things that God wants us to do. And that's much of the wickedness and everything you see going on around us. So when I say love not the world, I'm not saying we don't love people. I'm not saying we walk out of these doors and we look at everybody as suspect. That's where I've said there's a difference between isolation and separation. We separate ourselves from the cares of this world. We try to keep it from getting a hold of us. We separate ourselves from the influences and philosophies of this world that we know are rooted in the devil and rooted in the lust, the flesh, the lust, the eyes, and the pride of life. We separate ourselves from those. But we love the people, and it should be our goal to reach those people and pull them out of this world and to help them understand the world doesn't love them, the world hates them, but God loves them, and God wants to deliver them. So there's the difference there between the world system and the people of this world. But he said we're not to love this world and the things that are in this world to let them get a hold of us. So the world will attack us and try to get us where we are not following God. They'll try to get the word of God to make have no effect in our lives. And it's that attack that we must guard against. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Let's have another word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the lesson. And we'll get into this there. Father... We thank you for your word. I thank you for its truth. <clears throat> I thank you that, God, it has power. And that, Lord, we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We know we can have victory over this world. Yet we know that the world would attack us. The world would influence us wrongly and pull us astray. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn from these lessons uh, to protect ourselves. But again, Lord, I pray we would balance it with understanding we're not isolating ourselves totally from the world. We are in the world trying to reach the world, love the world as far as the people in it, but not trying to be of the world. And I pray, God, you just teach us the difference and help us uh, to see these attacks that the world would bring against us and to protect ourselves from it. Use your word, I pray, this morning. I ask these things in your name. Amen. So first of all, <clears throat> the world, if it can, would destroy Christianity. Now understand that in some cases, uh, right now in the United States of America, you do not see the all-out attack against Christianity as strongly as it is in other places. Now I'll say this, it's stronger than it was when I was a kid, and it's considerably stronger than those of you who are older than me than it was when you were a kid. But Chris, we, are, we are living, that's one thing Barack Obama said that unfortunately was more or less true and he helped to usher in. He said we're a post-Christian nation, or he, actually he just said we're not a, we never have been a Christian nation. That's not true. <clears throat> but what you expect from a secular Marxist Muslim. But anyway, um, but while that is not true, we do have a Christian heritage that we have as Americans, and as such, we've enjoyed a great deal of freedom. But in other nations, that freedom is not there. Ultimately, the world would destroy Christianity if it could, and mark it down. That day is coming if we don't see some things changed in the United States of America. You, you think those 87,000 new IRS agents are are going to be bad for regular Americans. They are, but mark it down. They'll come after churches. They will come after any type of Christian organization. They will shut down everything that they can if that is not stopped. And I don't care where your politics are. Those are just facts. <laughs> That's just really the way it is. But the goal of destroying Christianity, understand, ultimately doesn't come from a government. It comes from the devil. And that's where we must always accurately look at the way this world is attacking us. So they would destroy Christianity, first of all, by promoting hatred for <clears throat> Christianity. By promoting hatred for Christianity. If you've got your Bible, head to John chapter number 15. 
John chapter number 15. By the way, the world hating Christ and Christians was not news to Jesus. In John 14 and 15 and 16, you have uh, Jesus speaking to his disciples more or less on his way to Gethsemane. In John chapter 17, we have his high priestly prayer there within the Garden of Gethsemane. And pretty much when that is done, they come, they take Jesus, and they will put him through a trial all night long, resulting in his death the next day. So his last words to his disciples before he heads to the cross, we find recorded in John 14 and 15 and 16. There's a lot of great truth that's recorded in this. But in the midst of all of this, he warns them over and over of persecution and hatred of this world. In John 15, in verse number 18, you'll notice here's what he says. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world... But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world will promote the idea of hatred for Christianity. Isn't it interesting? Now think about this. You've got a, a secular society in the United States of America, a secular, humanist, quote unquote, tolerant society that says we should embrace all of those different letters, L, G, B, T, Q, I, A, and, and whatever 500 million other things they add on there, as long as they don't put C for Christian. But we need to embrace tolerance <clears throat> of all of these other groups, okay? Right? That's on the one hand. Now, on the other hand, they will give a great deal of tolerance to Muslims. <clears throat> Where in Muslim nations, if you are known to be one of those sodomites, that's the Bible word for all those LGBTQIA stuff there. That's the Bible word. But if in, in a Muslim nation, if you were one of those, the Muslims will kill somebody like that. Yet it's interesting, our society is very tolerant of Muslims who will behead them. And very tolerant of those who live that lifestyle but intolerant of the Christian who simply comes to them and says, listen, your lifestyle is destroying you, it's destroying those around you, it's an abomination before God, but Jesus died on the cross for your sin, he loves you, he wants to forgive you, wants to redeem you out of that lifestyle, and we try to help them, we're the intolerant ones. Now how does that work? Well, it's very simple. The world hates us because we resemble Christ, but it will love its own. In the end, the world that is tolerant of the sodomy will also be tolerant of the Muslim because ultimately they're all on the same side. Their master is Satan and they will serve him. This is an extremely politically incorrect message, just in case you haven't figured it out. But this is the way it works. And it's been going on for forever. This isn't new to the United States of America. We're just beginning to see some of this kind of thing. But this is the world we have because, again, it goes deeper than the World Economic Forum or or whatever else you see in all this stuff. Ultimately, it goes back to its master, Satan, and he is out to destroy this world and destroy Christianity. And it goes all the way back. Jesus, as he's heading to the cross, as he's heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, the world's going to hate you because you're going to be different. And they don't like different. They don't like anything different than this world. You will not be popular. They will hate you. They will persecute you. They do this by distorting presentations of Christian beliefs. If you want to jot down, I'm not going to turn there, but in Acts chapter 16, you would find uh, that they come and they say of uh, Paul and Silas there, they say, hey, these guys are teaching things that are not lawful for us to do as Romans. Now, that was simply not true. 
There was nothing that Paul and Silas were teaching that was contrary to being a Roman. It was contrary to Jewish law. There was nothing they were teaching that was contrary to Roman. Truth is, when a Christian really begins to follow the Bible, they're the best citizens that this world has ever known. They love, they have loving kindness, they're thoughtful of other people, they will forgive rather than kill. Uh, all these types of things, Christians who are following the Bible. I understand there's people who have claimed to be Christians through the years, not follow the Bible. I understand that's true. But Christians following the teachings of Christ are the best citizens that have ever existed. And so, they, but they will try to distort it and present us as, as dangerous. It's going on today. Christian white nationalists, any of those three terms, we're more or less a domestic terrorist. It's, it's a strange thing when loving your country and promoting your flag makes you dangerous in the eyes of your government. Last time I checked, being patriotic to your country is only dangerous to a government that's occupying you. Sorry, that's just true. And being true to the Word of God makes us dangerous because we're not going to go along with a world government. We're not going to go along with a world religion. And so therefore, they don't like that. That scares them. We're going to teach them the truth. We're going to try to rescue someone from their clutches. And that makes us dangerous. We're not going to do it with guns. We're not going to do it with fighting. We're going to do it with the truth. And so therefore, but they're going to misrepresent us. And they're going to attack us. Christians are hateful. Christians are bigots. Christians are racist. Christians are blah, 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 blah. Same old song saying the same thing. But that is not true. We love people. We just want them to hear the truth, and we want to help them. It, it, it's not a hatred for people. Uh, they say that of their hatred for us. The world would destroy Christianity by persecuting it and limiting its freedoms. <clears throat> by the way, when I say the United States of America hasn't ever suffered this, I'm speaking since we became a nation with a Bill of Rights. You go back and study some Baptist history uh, you'll, you're, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find there were a lot of Baptists that had to do a lot of preaching from their jail cell in the late, in the mid to late 1700s. It happened a great deal. They would, they would be in a creek baptizing, and rowdies would come along in their horses and ride through the and, and, and grab the minister, and they would drag him out of the water. In some cases, they would grab him and they would drown them. This, this happened in the United States of America. Yeah, there was a man by the name of Obadiah Holmes in the 1600s. As he was there in Massachusetts, he worshipped God as a Baptist. He lived in Rhode Island. They were worshipping God as a Baptist, but because they weren't going to the state church, was the Congregational Church, Episcopal Church at the time, because they weren't going to the state church, they took him, they brought him, they put him uh, before the whipping post, and they whipped him for not going to their church. Separation of church and state, I'm way off my topic here, but while we're here, while we're here, separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. In fact, the concept of the separation of church and state was Thomas Jefferson writing a letter to the Danbury Baptists because the Baptists said, we're tired of getting persecuted in this country. If we're going to join in with a new nation, what we want to know is, will we be protected to worship God according to our conscience? It's a Baptist doctrine, for the record, a liberty of conscience. And he said, will we be allowed to do that? And Thomas Jefferson said there should be a separation of church and state, meaning the state has no authority over the church. That was a Baptist truth. That was a Baptist doctrine that landed itself in the Bill of Rights, which was not just about freedom of the press. It was about the freedom to worship God as we wanted. And so as a result, in the United States of America, we've enjoyed the opportunity to worship God freely and to enjoy worshiping God as we believe the Bible dictates for us to do. But it's not always been that way, and the day is very likely coming that it will not be that way again. And when that happens, remember, it's the world and the devil that are behind it. It's not just a human philosophy or a human ideology. The world has always hated Christianity. 
by promo- uh, by just to try to destroy Christianity by promoting hatred for Christianity. That's my shortest point, and I need to get moving. And uh, they also promote hindering the truth. Mark chapter four, we saw that with the um, uh, with the choking out of the word of God, promoting hindrances to the truth. They do this by trying to keep Christians from sharing their faith. As Christianity was beginning to grow, the apostles would be taken and they would be beaten. They would be killed. They were beheaded. They were crucified. They were boiled in oil. There were all kinds of things that happened to keep the truth from being spread. Uh, They will promote other religions. The world will promote anything but true Christianity. And they would punish Christians by taking away things from them. Again, the playbook has been here before. In the early days of our Baptist history, in America, again, as they were doing a lot of this persecuting, what they would do is the government would come in and seize the property, whether they were meeting, or seize the properties that were owned by the pastor in an effort to try to totally... Uh, keep them from being able to worship God freely. Uh, Often unknown, but what some people call the actual first battle of the Revolutionary War happened in, uh, no, I'm going to draw a blank, 17, I want to say 54, but uh, what was known as the War of the Regulators down in the Carolina area where the government came in and were trying to make the Baptists come to heel and they began to come against them. They fought back against them. They ended up losing the battle. Uh, but these, these things were happening, and they were seizing churches, seizing property, seizing the property of the pastors. They came in through <clears throat> financial regulation. Just, just saying. <laughs> you take a look and you read the news today, and if you've ever read a history book, you just go, here we go again. Because that is exactly what's playing out. I'm just, just, just saying that's the way it is. So they would try to destroy Christianity. That, I believe, is coming. But for us, much the world will try to disable Christianity. So moving away from these government topics, if YouTube is still allowing me to uh, stream right now, uh, they would try to disable Christianity. The world will try to disable Christianity. It does so, first of all, through corruption. Turn to James chapter 1, if you would. James chapter number 1. And understand that our our biggest danger is often not government persecution. Much of the time, the government persecution tends to make churches stronger. Some of the places that Christianity is growing the greatest is in the underground churches in China right now. It is in underground churches in Muslim countries. In fact, imams are meeting and saying, how do we stop this Christianity from spreading in underground churches? There have been uh, radio stations in free countries nearby that are broadcasting into these nations. And there are Muslims that are coming to get saved. People coming out of Yemen as they watched one Muslim group fight the other Muslim group. And they said, surely there's something more. And they've gotten saved. So while persecution comes, often God's churches thrive. But a place that's dangerous is when the world would try to get us through its corruption. Look at James chapter 1. Look at verse number 27. James chapter 1, verse number 27. He says, pure religion... And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That word corruption is simply the idea of trying to mar or trying to spoil something. If you learn, look in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20, Second Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20. Actually, I'm sorry. Look at chapter 1 and verse number 4. I forgot that one. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that be, by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the way that the world will corrupt us is by appealing to to our lust. Second Peter 2, verse 20, he calls, says it this way. He says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions, 
of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Really, this is a beautiful picture of the um, story of the uh, parable of the sower. But he speaks here and he calls it the pollution of the world. So he calls it being unspotted, being spotted by the world. He calls it the corruption of this world. He calls it pollution of this world. What is, what's the idea going on here? Well, elsewhere in Scripture you find that God is trying to keep Christians pure, holy. The world messes that up through its corruption, pollution, and marring. Well, how does it do that? Here are some ways I've got down that, uh, again, if you want to throw these in on some of your extra blanks there. But the world will try to do this through the love of money. The love of money. 1 Timothy 6, 17 talks about this. James 2, 5 talks about this. The deceitfulness of riches. So the world will try to get you through the love of money. Somebody will say the money is the root of all evil. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not wicked. Money is not dangerous. Falling in love with money is. And letting that appeal to your lust is what is danger. And that corrupts many people. Lust is another way the world will corrupt us. In fact, he said that all that is in the world, and what are, everything that was in the world, he says, boil down to three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Popularity. Popularity and seeking to be popular in this world, this can corrupt. It's corrupted many a preacher. It's corrupted many a Christian. Seeking to be get the accolades and the pleasure and the approval of this world. Listen, I don't like anybody hating me any more than anybody else does. Sometimes that's a revelation to people. <laughs> they think, oh, I think you just like people disliking you. No, I really don't. I, I don't like it at all. I like to be friends with everybody. But I, I, I'm mature enough to know that that's never going to happen in this world, no matter who you are. And so I, I look at it, and I like absolutes. And so I go, well, who's the one person I can always know how to please them? Well, God, because he gives me in his word, he instructs me how to do that. I can try to please you, but tomorrow what pleased you today will not please you tomorrow. Uh, look at any politician. That, what a miserable life to have to go off of polls. And, uh, and uh, well, uh, yesterday, you know, that, that's some of the fun. These guys have been there forever. You know, you get these clips. Biden will come out and say that he's for such and such, and they'll play a, a clip from the 1980s or the 90s or even 10 years ago where he was completely for that. Of course, John Kerry was the most famous. And in 2004 convention, they had to carry flip-flops because uh, he was always flip-flopping back and forth. Most recently, uh, Anthony Fauci has tried to compete for that title. Uh, but anyway, but they're always going with the popularity of all these things back and forth, back and forth. Man, God is the only one who it really matters as we approve. And if you start living for the approval of this world, mark it down, this world will corrupt you. Pride is another way in which they will try to get you. Secondly, then, under disabling Christianity, he does it not only through corruption, but through conformity. Through conformity. Look at Romans chapter 12, if you would. Romans chapter number 12. It's not enough. The world doesn't just sit back and say, well, that works for you. Eh, some people in the world will do that. But as a system, that's not okay. You must be like them. It's not enough to just say, we accept that you are this way. They want us to say they are right. They want us to be just like them. And it's not new. God warned us about it in Romans 12, verse 2, where he said, And be not conformed to this world. The idea of conforming something is something that happens from external pressure. You conform something. I, I used to work in a factory in a fabrication unit, and we were making air conditioning and heating units. And so I would start out with a piece of metal, and I had this massive uh, die that I would do, and I would press a button, and this massive heavy piece of machinery would come down and place this pressure on this metal, and that metal would just cave to bend to the exact shape that it was supposed to be. I'd let go of the button and it would go back up and then I had that piece of metal 
perfectly conformed to the external pressure. That's the idea of the word conform. He said, be not conformed to this world. So if we know we're not supposed to be, we know the world is going to try to conform us. What's the alternative? But be ye transformed. Transformation happens from within, making its way outward. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The world will try to conform us and make us um, more like them. They'll say some things like this. If you're different, no one will listen to you. You must be like the world if you're going to reach the world. The problem is, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, For ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. I know I'm not getting that in the right order. That ye may show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God said the very fact that you are different is going to be what he will use to tell people that there's a change and that that is possible for them. They may mock you. They may laugh at you. Listen, I've worked secular jobs. I've had them mock me. I've had them laugh at me. I've had them ask me to leave the room so they could cuss and not feel bad about it. But whenever they had a problem, my phone was the one that rang. They didn't go to their worldly friends. They didn't go to their drinking buddies. They went to the Christian because... I was not like them, and there was something different, and they wanted what I had. Folks, that is what attracts people to the truth. Being different is not a uh, part of Christianity that you have to live with. It is a feature of Bible Christianity, not an anomaly. It is exactly what it's supposed to be. But they'll say, if you're different, no one will listen to you. That's an attempt to conform you. They'll say, borrow the tactics from the world. To draw a crowd. I know uh, uh, I mentioned before, I've known a, um, a, a song leader in a very well, or music director in a well known church uh, that went to Las Vegas for a week to study the shows to figure out how they attracted crowds through their music, and he was going to go back and apply it in his church. Um, that is conforming to the world. I don't see how you see anything different than that. Uh, I've I've mentioned this. I'm not going to make a point of it. But the world will say, don't be so heavenly minded. You're of no earthly good. I think this worldly earth could use people that are a little more heavenly minded and share the truth with them. Uh, You can be a Christian without being fanatical about it. That's what the world, that's just an attempt to conform you into the world. Uh, You know, isn't it interesting? The world can have its fanatics. People can go out in the freezing cold without their shirt on, painted two different colors of their team, and holler for a bunch of fat guys chasing a pigskin. But that's not fanatical. (laughs) But let a Christian try to tell somebody about something that will change their entire eternity, and all of a sudden we're a fanatic. (laughs) Oh, well, that's the world for you. James chapter 4. Look at James chapter 4. Look at James chapter 4. They'll also try to get you through compromise. Compromise. Man, i got to move. James chapter 4. Where did James go? There it is. Verse 4. James chapter 4, verse number 4. He said, Whosoever, I'm sorry, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of this world is the enemy of God. God says there's no in-between. There's no... Switzerland here. There's no neutrality. The world then will try to get us to compromise and become friends of this world. This is the goal of the world. They'll say things like this. You know, a little sin will keep you humble. (laughs) Romans chapter 6 says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God does not want a little sin in there to keep us humble. God wants us to conquer that sin. Listen, when you recognize that you're guilty of sin and you recognize who you are as a sinner, it's not hard to get humble. It really is not. When you realize how wicked you are and how great God is and that He is your only hope, you're not going to have trouble with humility. You're going to look at yourself as the wicked sinner that that God sees you and, and most others do. Uh, The world will say, being all things to all men means I should be like the world in some areas. You look at that, I don't have time to debate that passage, but if you go take a look at it, it, it's talking about he used 
uh, the languages and he appealed to them and, and to understand their uh, their nationality in ways they could understand the scriptures, but it didn't say that he compromised the truth to become like them. Uh, some will say, if I have just a little bit of the world in me, I can reach more people. And they tell the churches, bigger is better. You know, it's interesting. I was reading a book by a man, Ian Bounds. He lived, uh, he was in the Civil War uh, for a time. So he lived in the late 1800s. I was reading a book by him just the other day, and he was talking about, he said, you know, they tell us today, I thought this was so funny, late 1800s, they tell us today that we need to be worried about making sure we get all the numbers uh, into our churches. He said, God is more worried about purity than he is about the numbers. I thought, you got to be kidding me. They were debating this 150 years ago. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Doesn't God say that? If I have to give in a little on my convictions uh, to keep my job, I must do it. Listen, my friend, if you will remain true to your convictions, God can give you a better job. Uh, the world will say, well, if, if I dress like that, there'll be things that I want to do that I won't be able to do. If you're pleasing God, you'll be able to do all the things you need to do. If I put these kind of restrictions on what I watch, I won't be able to watch anything. Well, David said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And there are many others that the world will try to get us just give in a little and compromise. Um, I, I don't have time. I'll, let me give you the rest of the outline here. You can look at this later. But the world will use craftiness. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19 talks about the craftiness of this world. They'll get you to question the Bible, laugh at your beliefs. Uh, and indirectly support evil. Uh, number five there, they will use the cares of this world to get you. We've already looked at that. They'll use the cares of this world. Uh, the world will get you to say, well, get set financially, then serve God. Uh, you need to make sure your kids get to enjoy everything all the other kids are enjoying. That's the cares of this world reaching into us. I, I serve God as long as it doesn't change my present lifestyle. But if God asks me to give up anything in my present lifestyle, then, you know, I, I may have to draw a line on how far I go to serve God. That's the cares of this world attacking you. And then uh, cruelty. The world will use, use cruelty. Uh, I've had them tell me this. Your kids are going to turn out bad because they don't have enough freedom. I've had them tell me this when I was a teenager. You know, again, a Christian education is a lesser education. It doesn't prepare you for life. <laughs> so getting the Word of God, teaching my children a biblical worldview doesn't prepare them for life. So what does? Critical race theory? Teaching them that they can't figure out what gender they are? Oh, that prepares them for life? <laughs> oh, listen, my friend. Giving my child a biblical worldview is the best way that I can prepare them for life. I'm not limiting them. I am strengthening them to handle this world. By the way, I had a Christian education all the time growing up. My dad was a public school teacher. And he prayed that not one of us would ever have to go to a public school. I had a Christian education, and I am perfectly fine with it. Also, for the record, my dad brought home his 12th grade math test and gave it to me when I was in 7th grade, and I scored higher than over 80% of his class, taking the exact same curriculum that my kids are taking today. So I'm just simply saying, when the world tells you that, the facts do not support that. Uh, what, what will happen is you give your kids a Christian education, they're less likely to go blow up a public school. Uh, they are less likely uh, to, to you know, shoot somebody because they don't like their hamburger at McDonald's. There are a lot of things they're less likely to do, uh, but most of those we don't want them doing anyway. Then the world will try to divide Christianity by sending in false prophets, by misrepresenting the truth, and let her see by compromising the truth by compromising uh, the truth. I don't have time to go turn to all of those, but he did warn of those who lead contrary to the doctrine, contrary to the truth, and we must guard ourselves against that. Listen, there uh, again, I'm, I'm out of time, but there are mainstream denominations right now that in, within their denominations, there's massive division happening because. Of a lot of there, there's Marxism creeping in, 
There is critical race theory creeping in. There is, of course, all of the sodomite and transgender agenda that's happening. And we're talking within Methodism. We're talking within Southern Baptist. We're talking within the Episcopal. We're talking within a Presbyterian. We're talking within large-scale uh, denominations. These kinds of things are happening. Do not think that that is not the devil and the world behind all of that. Now, they would tell you that those who remain true to the Scriptures were the divisive ones. But that's not true. God said contrary to the doctrine. That's what we're to be warned against. The world will disable us, divide us, or destroy us if it can. We must remain true to the Scriptures. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it gives us the truth and can protect us, Lord, if we will allow it to instruct us. Now meet with us in the next service, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.